Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. The Messenians, together with the Helots, at first advanced against the city of Sparta, assuming that they would take it because there would be no one to defend it. But when they heard that the survivors were all drawn up in a body with Archidamus the king, and were ready for a struggle on behalf of their native land, they gave up this plan, and seizing a stronghold in Messenia, they made it their base of operations, and from there continued to overrun Laconia. Diodorus Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 57, Troubles on the Peloponnese. We now find ourselves in a position where both Sparta and Athens had somewhat established policies coming out of the Persian invasion. This, as we have seen, took the good part of a decade, as both cities were dealing with their own competing factions, as well as the relations between each other. As we saw, the mutual suspicions that had been present before the Persian invasions would come back to the forefront, but with the policies that evolved, conflict was avoided. Sparta had settled on focusing on their interests in the Greek mainland, rather than the Aegean though certain events would see their attention, out of necessity, switch to the region closer to their homeland. While Athens would keep their main efforts in the Aegean, with the creation of the Delian League and its subsequent campaigns. Though this was no foregone conclusion, as the hero of Salamis, Themistocles, had been advocating with a far more aggressive policy towards Sparta, but with his ostracism and then his exile, tensions would cool. For Athens, the campaigns of the Delian League would continue to unfold, after their victory at the Eurymedon River, though problems within the League's membership would continue to arise. The island of Thassos, who had been an original member, revolted, while well, this is how Athens saw it anyway. We heard from our ancient sources that the main point that led to this development was the overlapping economic interests in the coastal regions of Thrace, where Athenian colonists had started venturing over the past decade. The Delian League, with Athens having gained more control over it as the years unfolded, would lay siege to the island, after defeating their navy. This would see Thassos seek help from outside the League that was supposed to protect them from outside threats. They would turn to Sparta for this help, who would agree to attack Athenian territory in a secret agreement. Though the attack would not eventuate as a great and terrible earthquake would rock the Peloponnese, causing other problems for the Spartans. Thassos would end up falling in the third year of the siege, and like other members who had revolted, they were forced back into the membership and tribute exacted on them. In addition to this, Athens would gain much of the benefits from their economic control of Thassos and previously held regions. The episode around Thassos had shown us that there appears to be a change in the policy or the attitudes that the Spartans held towards Athens. This is the first overtly hostile action we hear of being contemplated. This episode will continue with the events after Thassos in both Athens and Sparta, where we'll then see this attitude continue to build, though not in a straightforward manner. This I think will highlight the interactions between the opposing factions in Sparta that we tend not to get any detail on. We will view how this would develop through the earthquake that hit Sparta and the events resulting from it. Also, we will see the interactions between Sparta and Athens through this period, as Sparta would turn to the Hellenic alliance made before Xerxes' invasion. This would also lead to consequences in Athenian politics, seeing Chimon's popularity wane. All of these developments that would occur would see the path to conflict be further laid. Last episode we briefly covered the Great Earthquake that rocked Sparta and other areas of the Peloponnese. Now let's head back to this event that occurred during the Athenian siege of Thassos, and then we can follow events on the Peloponnese that would result. It appears the earthquake would take place during the winter of 465-464, this being put forward by the historian Paul Ray. According to Ray, this seems like the most likely period since Thassos would have already had been seeking Spartan help, with us knowing the siege developed in 465. As we would see from the many campaigns that would take place throughout ancient times, they were for the most part conducted during warmer months. Engaging in a naval enterprise during the stormy winter period would have been recklessly hazardous. So it is thought that once the siege developed and Thassos saw what it was up against, 
they would have sought help from the Spartans. Ray then puts forward that with the Spartans having agreed to assist, they would then need time to arrange for a campaign to direct at Attica. Again, winter was not the chosen time for land campaigns either, so they would have been waiting for warmer months to return to 464. Since Sparta would never get the chance to march against the Athenians, it then seems very likely the earthquake took place before the weather had changed, since this would be the reason for the attack not eventuating. So we learnt last episode from our ancient sources that the earthquake was devastating, with it appearing that Sparta had been hardest hit. Diodorus would even tell us that over 20,000 Spartans would perish in the quake. Also, the accounts indicate that the tremors would last for some time, perhaps describing the aftershocks that would continue to be felt. This we can see pointed to when Diodorus says, Since the tumbling down of the city and the falling of the houses continued uninterruptedly over a long period, many persons were caught and crushed in the collapse of the walls, and no little house property was ruined by the quake. Last episode, we looked at what the ancients would say about the disaster, and all we really had to go off are anecdotal accounts that were written down over a hundred years later, though admittedly apparently taken from earlier sources. Last time I mentioned that modern historians somewhat doubted the death toll given, so for this episode I want to briefly look at the disaster from the point of modern research. Now we are not going to get any true detailed account of the experience of the earthquake felt by those nearly two and a half thousand years ago, but what we can do is look to what the science tells us about the disaster and what the likely effects of it would be. Greece had experienced seismic activity for hundreds of thousands of years, and still continues to do so today. The reason for this activity is due to the meeting of two tectonic plates, this being the African plate and the Aegean Sea plate. Where these plates meet in Greece would form what is called the Hellenic Arch, given the arch-like appearance of these two plates beneath Greece and the Aegean. The line would run roughly down the western and central Peloponnese towards the Mediterranean, then it would start arching around the island of Crete, before then continuing to head towards Anatolia just south of Rhodes. You will notice the rugged nature of the geography around this line. The mountains that run through the Peloponnese follow a more north to south line, while the islands appear to have been thrust up from the sea, with subsequent earthquakes shaping their rugged nature even more. You may also remember, back when we looked at the Bronze Age and the Minoans, that great earthquakes appear to have been taking place around Crete, that would have been from this same fault line, though some thousand years earlier. Again, because of how far in the past this earthquake on the Peloponnese took place, it is difficult for us to know exactly where the epicenter was and how powerful it was. Though with modern technology, field work has been done in 1991 to try and attempt to answer these questions. In the article presented to Nature, a possible normal fault line rupture of the 464 BC Spartan earthquake, the researchers believe that the earthquake originated on a fault in the region of the Tegetus mountain range. Looking back to our episode on Sparta, we showed that the settlement of Sparta developed in the Eurotus Valley, which the Tegetus mountains ran along. The researchers then honed in on the fault that they saw as being responsible, and then proceeded to estimate the magnitude of the quake. They concluded that the event in 464 BC would have been a medium to large one that took place, with it estimated it would have measured 7.2 on the surface wave scale. To put this in context, the recent earthquake on Haiti, which took place a year ago, August 2021, also measured 7.2. We also brought up the death toll reported from ancient times, where modern scholars have questioned the figure of over 20,000 that Diodorus reports. This was on the basis that it is thought that the population density in Sparta would have been fairly spread out, not to mention that the population of full Spartan citizens was not that great to begin with. Added to this, Sparta was not known for their large grand structures, which would be a major hazard in the earthquake. Though even with this in mind, we do get accounts preserved in the ancient sources that indicate that this was a great disaster. Also, the fallout that would occur around Sparta, that we will get to, indicated that the earthquake did put Sparta in a vulnerable position. Perhaps we should not take the figure of 20,000 too literal, but rather think of this as meaning a great many people. Plus, this earthquake would have not just affected Sparta, so perhaps with the passage of time, these numbers or proportions of people were all lumped into the same figure. This just not representing the citizens of Sparta. I also need to say a big thank you to Steve from the Spartan History Podcast, as he sent me the Nature article some time ago as a point of interest. I'm sure when he arrives at this point in his series, he will be looking a little deeper into this article. For us, I think what we have covered of the earthquake puts us in a good position to move forward with the narrative. 
where we have stressed that this was a great disaster from the perspective of the ancient writers and modern researchers. Perhaps down the track, taking a deeper dive into the earthquake would make a good bonus episode on Patreon. Anyway, it appears by all accounts, the earthquake of 464 BC was quite a large event experienced compared to other earthquakes in the preceding generations. How large it was, and to how devastating it was, is still open to debate. Though it would be enough of an event to cause follow-on troubles for Sparta. Others around them, who would have also experienced the earthquake, now perceive Sparta to be in a vulnerable state. The earthquake would now present the helic class of Sparta an opportunity. This was the class that had been subjected to the Spartans through past wars, with a great deal of them coming from the region of Messene. The chaos that appears to have been taking place in Sparta would present their masters in a vulnerable position. The helots for the most part did not dwell within Sparta itself, but were still in the fields of Messenia, where they farmed the lands for the Spartan benefit. For this reason, it appears that the earthquake had not affected their populations too much, as they would have had a much smaller farmhouse that did not pose the same dangers as the more heavily constructed Spartan buildings, even if they were only single-storey dwellings. As well as this, it is very possible, based on where the epicentre of the earthquake was, and how the shockwave travelled, Messenia may have not have felt the full force of it. However the earthquake affected them, they were still in a position to arrange what appears to be a well-organised revolt. Thucydides would say when relating matters around Sparta's secret agreement with Thassos. Unknown to the Athenians, she promised and intended to do so, but was prevented by the occurrence of the earthquake. Accompanied by the succession of the Helots and the Thuriots and the Athenians of the Periochi to Athome. Most of the Helots were descendants of the old Messenians that were enslaved in the famous war, and so all of them came to be called Messenians. What this passage that Thucydides relates to us is showing is that a number of populations within the region of Messenia were able to come together to revolt against Sparta. Not only this, but we even have different social classes also being involved in this revolt. Firstly, we see Thucydides refer to the Helots collectively, before then naming two other peoples. These both refer to towns within the region of Messenia, though instead of these populations being Helots, they appear to be from the Periochi class, who were not subjected peoples. If you remember back, the Periochi were a second class rank within Spartan society, their name meant those who dwelled around, and they would occupy a number of settlements within Laconia and Messenia. They would not have citizen rights within Spartan society, but were also not subjected to the Spartans. For the most part, the Perioiki would engage in the economic functions of Sparta, being involved in commerce and trade. Obviously these Perioiki over in Messenia had a great deal of contact with the Helot population, since this is where the greatest concentration of them were. Though why they were joined in the revolt against Sparta with the Helots is difficult to know. Maybe their population saw an opportunity making their own polis that they would have control over. Living in a society without a political voice would also see people not being free to a certain extent even though they would not technically be slaves. We then find Thucydides telling us that most of the Helots were Messenians, remembering other regions Sparta took control of also became Helots. The famous war he refers to is the Messenian War that took place sometime around 720 BC, where the region would be first subjected to the Spartans. The rebels would make their base of operations in the Athome Mountains, where the old Messenian capital had also been located. This was very rugged terrain and provided an excellent defensive position that would, as we will see, have the Spartans calling upon help from outside the Peloponnese to help bring these rebels under control. Here I want to take the opportunity to introduce a new Spartan royal figure that we have yet to meet, through an anecdote that Plutarch relates in his life of Chimon, this referring to the earthquake. Archidamus, by the present danger, made apprehensive of what might follow and seeing the citizens intent upon removing the most valuable of their goods out of their houses, commanded an alarm to be sounded, as if an enemy were coming down upon them, in order that they should collect about them in a body, with arms. It was this alone that saved Sparta at that time, for the helots were got together from the country about, with designs to surprise the Spartans and overpower those whom the earthquake had spared. But finding them armed and well prepared, they retired into the towns and openly made war with them. Archidamus had become king of Sparta in either 469 or 468, when his grandfather Leotychidus went into exile. Leotychidus had a son, but he died while he was still king, seeing that the kingship would then pass to his son instead, this being Archidamus. This would see Archidamus coming to inherit the kingship as quite a young man, 
though we are not sure how old he was at the time. Many have thought he was only just old enough to take the office without a regent, given how long he would reign. As we move closer towards the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War, King Archidamus will become quite prominent in the unfolding of events, and as we will see, will develop a reputation as being calm and collected. When he became king, he also supported the more peaceful approach to Athens to avoid conflict in the near future, where we will also see that he would continue this approach as events unfolded. Now when it comes to the passage I had just read out from Plutarch's Lives, many modern historians have questioned how true this was. The passage seems to indicate that an attack by the helots was unfolding immediately after the earthquake. Though it would seem it would take some time to arrange any sort of attack on the Spartans, especially given the unpredictable nature of earthquakes, and the level of organisation the rebels were supposed to have had. If we also accept this passage on face value, it would indicate that the revolt was being arranged well before the earthquake took place, which we did not get any indication of. But it is also possible that the seeds of dissatisfaction had been sowed more so over the past decade, where Paul Ray argues that the helots accompanying the Spartans on campaign to Plataea would have seen the rest of the Greek world being mostly free, they being the only Greeks with a master. While Pausanias' overtures, when going rogue to the helot population, if true, may have stirred up more interest in a movement to oppose Sparta. But even if this was the case, it still seems hard to believe the helots being in a position to act in an organised manner directly after the earthquake. It does seem very possible that Archidamus could have been responsible to bringing some sort of order back into the Spartan citizen body in the days and weeks after the disaster, where the revolt would face an organised and disciplined Sparta. The rebels may well have seen the earthquake as an opportunity, but given how they would have also been surprised by the event, it would have taken them some time to organise an attack outside of the few helots acting independently. What Plutarch's passage could be showing us is that by the time the rebels were able to mount an organised uprising, the core of Spartan society had been rallied under Archidamus, and the rebels now went to the hills to continue their bid for freedom. What's more, this interpretation fits in very closely with the account Diodorus replies. Although he is often thought as unreliable, how he presents these events make more sense and it is thought he was working from the works of the historian Ephorus, who lived much closer to these events. Anyway, this gives us a quick introduction to King Archidamus. The details on his early life are lacking, but we will be hearing about him a whole lot more in future episodes. Before we continue on with the developments during the revolt, I want to just touch on the matter of the divine seen in this event. As we have seen, great and terrible events are usually connected with past transgressions against the gods, some being linked back many generations, this helping explain to the ancients why they were subjected to such events. Here we get a brief glimpse of how the ancient Greek world saw Sparta's troubles originating though it only existing in a short passage by Thucydides. What he says comes about through discussions between the Spartans and Athenians down the track a bit from where we are now, but the Spartans had just made an argument as to why the Athenians should exile Pericles on the basis of a curse. Thucydides would then write, The Athenians countered the Spartans' demand by demanding that the Spartans should drive out the curse of Tanaris. For the Spartans in the past raised up some helot suppliants from the altar of Poseidon and had them taken away and killed them. They believe that the great earthquake in Sparta was the result of this. This is the extent of the detail that we have around this event that has been dubbed the massacre at Tanaris. Tanaris was the southern cape on the Peloponnese that was formed by the Tegetus mountain range. When this massacre took place is anyone's guess and what it was in response to is impossible at this stage to ascertain. Though it does point out the Greeks thoughts of why Sparta suffered from this earthquake, this natural disaster being the domain of Poseidon the Earthshaker. We don't get the Spartans' attitudes or thoughts around this connection, but we have seen in the past that in the ancient sources, they are presented as one of the most pious Greek city-states. Have you been enjoying the series and thinking of supporting the show in some way? Casting Through Ancient Greece is over on Patreon, where we have been providing supporters with monthly bonus episodes, where we look at past topics in more detail and isolation. So far we have revisited the Bronze Age of Greece, looking at art, trade connections, warfare and a number of other topics. We then advanced into the Archaic period, where we spent some time exploring the little known Latin War, the Olympic Games, emergence of the Hoplite and other areas. This then saw us turn to doing a three part series on the epic poet Homer, where we also explored the two epic poems the Iliad and the Odyssey that are credited to him. 
Currently we're exploring the development of both Sparta and Athens in more detail. We are beginning by focusing on their origin myths, which saw us first look at the return of the Heraclidae, which sought to explain the Spartans' rightful possession of their lands. The latest bonus episode to come out then has us turning to the origin myths explaining the birth of Athens and its development of many of the elements that would come to define it in classical times. This would see the gods competing for favour with the city, while then the stories around the hero Theseus would explain later developments. If you're interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you'll receive early access, ad-free episodes, plus quarterly video series updates about what's been happening in the series, where we also run competitions. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website, where you can find the Patreon link as well as other ways to help support the series grow, when clicking on the Support the Series button. Thank you all for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. So let's now turn to the revolt and Sparta's response to it. To further attest to the scale of the rebellion and its organisation, it would not just fizzle out after initially coming up against a still unified Sparta. As we saw, a base for the rebels was created in the mountains, within Messenia, and it would require active campaigning by the Spartans to bring these helots back into the fold, and prevent their sentiment spreading to other populations. It would seem likely that after the initial failed attempt at attacking Sparta, the revolt would grow and spread perhaps going to include the regions and cities that Thucydides had reported as revolting against Sparta. It would appear that Sparta had made some attempts at penetrating into the rugged hills of Messene early on in the revolt, but recognised this was going to be a struggle that would require more resources and time to deal with. For these resources, they would make appeals to their allies to come to assist in bringing this rebellion under control. It would seem that an appeal had gone out to the members of the Peloponnesian League and the Hellenic League where we know a number would respond and answer Sparta's call, though we can only be certain of a few that would come to assist. It appears that the polis of Mantinea, where we had seen troubles for Sparta develop due to the rise in power of their democratic faction only a few years earlier, may have been one of the first to respond. Mantinea's independence pretty much rested with Spartan support, as tensions with their neighbour, Tegea, were a constant feature of their relations. Now with the tegean argive alliance, Mantinea would find herself extremely vulnerable without Sparta, this seen the city's interest in seeing Sparta survive and remain powerful. Another city, or rather island, that we're aware of coming to Sparta's aid was that of Aegina. Although not part of the Peloponnese, Aegina was not that far from the Attic coast, and during the Archaic period, tensions between the island and Athens developed with both sharing the same sea trade routes. This would see Aegina, at odds with Athens, turn to the other great Greek power, Sparta, for support. We would also later learn, as the Peloponnesian War unfolded, Sparta would offer the people of the island a town and land when they were expelled from Aegina by the Athenians. This, as Thucydides informs us, would be due to the assistance the island provided Sparta in the wake of the earthquake and during the Helot Revolt. Though the last city-state that we are aware of coming to Sparta's aid would perhaps be one of the most surprising. A Spartan herald was also sent to Athens the very city Sparta had secretly conspired to attack before the earthquake struck. It would appear that Sparta's policy towards Athens was far from settled within Spartan politics, with these about turns presented through events. Only perhaps a year ago, Sparta had agreed to attack Athenian territory, which also seemed out of place given the passive nature the two cities had come to follow towards one another. Also, Cimon was in control at this stage where Sparta, at the time, had seen him as the most favourable figure in Athens to put their support behind. Like I have said before, we don't get accounts of the inner workings within Spartan politics, but through the events it appears we are witnessing the back and forward nature of factions looking to have their policies followed. Now in the wake of the earthquake and having to deal with the revolt, Sparta found herself in a weakened state when it came to challenging Athenian position and growing power. A policy of avoiding conflict with Athens seems to have become popular once again, and perhaps this policy had gone further, as it now sought Athens' help. This in the eyes of those who had agreed to the surprise attack, surely would have seen this as presenting themselves from a point of weakness. As we shall see, it would appear the factional debates would continue as a revolt unfolded. In Thucydides' account, we can perhaps find more motivations of why Sparta turned to Athens for help. 
We know the revolt would drag on with Spartan operations into the rough Messenian mountains, unable to bring the rebels under control. The helots were operating from an excellent defensive position, and this is what would lead to Sparta seeking Athens' help. Thucydides would say, The chief reason that they asked for Athenian help was that the Athenians had a reputation of being good at siege operations, and, after a long siege, it became clear to the Spartans that they themselves lacked experience in this department of warfare. Back in Athens, the siege of Thassos and a great deal of their military resources would have come back to Athens, where they would be in a position to send the military aid if they chose to do so. This request that arrived in Athens would see debate break out in Athenian politics as they decided on how they would respond. Through Plutarch, we would see that the anti-Spartan attitudes had not disappeared with Themistocles' exile. There would be new political figures that would pick up the mantle of this tradition in a sense. Through them, they were looking to steer Athens' policy away from what Cimon had worked towards, and what would have been the status quo regarding Sparta at this stage. Now, I know I had said last episode we would meet these new political figures, but I think I'll do this next episode as I want to follow the narrative of the aftermath of the earthquake. Looking at Pericles and Ephialdes next episode will fit in a lot better as we will look in a little deeper into how Athenian politics was unfolding over this period and beyond. Ephialdes would argue that Athens should not respond to Sparta's request as it was the rival to Athens and now was the chance to see Sparta lose their power and influence. He wished Athens to stand by idle and watch Sparta be trodden under. What's interesting here is that we don't have any accounts showing the other man, Pericles, who had become Cimon's great rival, to have any anti-Spartan sentiments at this stage. If you recall, his father had been an ally of Cimon, where policy was being formed through the 470s. As we will see next episode, it appears to be domestic matters that would cause the great rivalry. Though Cimon was still a popular man in Athens, and he remained friendly towards Sparta, during the debates he was able to convince his fellow Athenians to support sending help to the Peloponnese, and aid them in bringing the revolt under control. We hear Cimon would march at the head of a sizable force, perhaps up to 4,000 strong. Though it would seem the political sands in Sparta were once again shifting. It is unclear how long the Athenians had been on the Peloponnese, or if they'd even taken part in any action. But Cimon would be approached and told that Athenian assistance was no longer required. Apparently that would be the only polis that came to aid Sparta that would be told this. Maybe seeing the collective Athenian force on their soil spooked those who only saw the debates around the relations as abstract ideas. Now though, a strong Athenian force was within their territory and there were plenty within Sparta that viewed Athens as a rival. Maybe these elements of Spartan politics began to talk up the threat that the Athenians represented, exaggerating the dangers they brought to their lands. The Thucydides would tell us of Sparta's reasons for wanting to turn the Athenians back. The Spartans failing to catch Ithome by assault grew afraid of the enterprise and unorthodoxy of the Athenians. They reflected, too, that they were of different nationality, and feared that, if they stayed on the Peloponnese, they might listen to the people of Athome and become the sponsors of some revolutionary policy. Sparta, of course, would not tell the Athenians any of this. They would just say that their services were no longer required, though Cimon and the rest of the Athenians knew that they were not getting the whole story. They would have been aware that none of the other allies had also been asked to leave. It would now appear that these suspicions that had existed before the Greco-Persian Wars, and had been put in the background during it, were bubbling back to the surface. This episode in Athenian-Spartan relations would see open hostility between the two develop for the first time since Cleomenes was king back in Sparta, in the 6th century. Sparta and Athens were now closer to conflict than ever before, the current trajectory making it hard to see how it could be avoided. The policy that Cimon had championed over the last decade had seen that Athens would avoid antagonizing Sparta and where possible treat the city with respect, while attempting to rely on mutual friendship. As we have seen, the issue over the relations with Sparta was at the core of the factional disagreements, especially with Themistocles and the support around him. Cimon had enjoyed support within the Athenian assembly for the good part of a decade now, but as we have pointed out, new opposition was forming against him. An attempt had been made to try and remove Cimon from Athenian politics after the siege of Thassos, but his popularity was still too strong. But now, Athens had been disrespected, and the core of Cimon's policy towards Sparta was called into question. This treatment at the hands of Sparta appears to have been looked upon with great disdain in Athens, and seems to have changed the political landscape quite quickly. 
News of Sparta's slight appears to have reached Athens not long after Sparta's refusal for Athenian help, and well ahead of Cimon's return with the army. Ephialdes and his supporters would have viewed these events as a goldmine for their cause. They had been in a position of trying to work out how to bring Cimon down given the large level of support that he had, even in spite of their previous efforts. But this action in Sparta would change attitudes in Athens on its own to a degree. Ephialdes just needed to capitalise on this and fan the flames where it appears he would be extremely effective in this mission. This would now see Ephiodes in a position to begin enacting change within the political institutions before Cimon could return home to Athens. Not only this, but the popularity that Cimon had enjoyed had now been greatly damaged. And as we will see, it would have the Athenians agreeing to hold an ostracism the next year, where Cimon would find himself a prime candidate. During this fallout period, Athens would also come to alter its position around its alliances, with some key changes seeing it dissolve its membership in the Hellenic League, which both Athens and Sparta had still been members, while they would also form new alliances, some with cities hostile to Sparta, such as Argos. Though we will turn to these matters, as well as the political events taking place in Athens next episode, we will also acquaint ourselves a little better with Ephialdes and Pericles. To round out this episode, I want to head back to the Peloponnese and how the Spartans were faring with the revolt. Even though Athens had departed at Sparta's request, there were still other allies that remained to assist Sparta in their campaign of quelling the revolt. The details of how the rest of the campaign would unfold do not make their way to us through the sources, probably due to Athens no longer being involved, and now in a position where information coming out of the Peloponnese would have been severely reduced with a sudden conflict between themselves and Sparta. Though we would hear that Sparta would finally bring the revolt under control after four years of the rebels holding out. Terms would be agreed to, which saw the rebels given safe passage out of the Peloponnese. Though if they were to ever set foot back into the Peloponnese, whoever came across them would be able to keep them as their own personal slaves. The helots who departed the Peloponnese would make their way to Athens for assistance, knowing that they had developed open tensions with Sparta. The Athenians in turn would resettle the rebels in the city of Neopactus, just north of the Peloponnese on the opposite shore. The Athenians had recently gained control over the city, and this resettlement would see them retain influence there, and as we will see, this site would become very important to Athens during the Peloponnesian War. It is also put forward by Plutarch that certain practices focused at the helots were developed after this revolt, or what would also be called as a Third Mycenaean War, of which one was the development of the Cryptaea. The exact workings and designs of the Cryptaea are not that clear, but it is thought that it was an organisation of the Spartans who had proved themselves ableist during the Agoge. Different interpretations could perhaps see us viewing them as a sort of an elite unit of Spartans, or maybe more a secret police. Though it would seem toughness and independence were at the core of their training program. Plutarch would record, that one of the Cryptaea's main functions was to head out into the lands that the Helots resided, and would identify the ablest or those thought to be stirring troubles, and have them murdered. Although the creation of this institution is often associated with Lycurgus, Plutarch says that it is his opinion that the practices of the Cryptaea would begin taking place after the earthquake and revolt of the Helots in 464, this being a measure to ensure a revolt on this scale would not break out again. So as we have seen this episode, the unforeseen shaking of the Peloponnese would see the relationship between Sparta and Athens altered, just after it looked as though a common policy of avoiding conflict had settled in. It had appeared that Sparta remained continually suspicious of Athens, with perhaps an element in Sparta gaining support for an attack on Attica during the siege of Thassos, though this would not eventuate. The earthquake that the Spartans would endure, and the Helot revolt resulting from it, would now also see themselves in a vulnerable position, while also contending with these suspicions. The open hostility would not only see relations disintegrate, but it would have disastrous effects on Chiron and support back in Athens, this now opening the way for a shift in domestic and interpolis policies. Next episode we will turn to look at what was happening within Athenian politics during this period, and the changes that would occur afterwards. This will also give us the opportunity to meet the political figures of Ephialdes and Pericles. Ephialdes would rise to be one of the main figures in opposition to Cimon during this period, while Pericles would be in the background of events, more so looking towards domestic policy. Though, as we will see, an early and unfortunate demise for Ephialdes 
would see Pericles come to occupy the leading role within this newly revived faction. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting it on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting for Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting for Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 58, Shifting Sands in Athens. <laughs>